David Kelly, welcome back to the Ikara and Kuka Report. Thank you. Nice to be back. It's great to have you back. When we uh, first spoke, I think it was in November uh, or December 2020, uh, it was before the book was in preparation, the book that you published uh, a few months later, Ivan Illich, An Intellectual, Intellectual Journey. It, it's just a, it's a marvelous book. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, I've read it cover to cover. Um, I, I think it's going to be the reference uh, on Illich for, for years to come. I can't imagine anybody topping this. And it's a great, for people who don't know Ivan Illich, a great introduction to his thought. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a great book. Uh, it Thank you. It sti stimulated me to, um, to read. Uh, after reading your book, I, uh, I did a series of podcasts with a few friends, one of whom uh, is a common friend, Charles, uh, Charlie Deist. And we did a series on, um, on uh, Illich's uh, uh, Shadow Work book. And uh, we took it chapter by chapter. It's like, you know, five or six chapters. Yes. And, and it was great. It, it's made a lot of impact on me. Uh, you know, Illich has made recently through your book, even though I knew Illich for a long time, but through your book and I've rediscovered him. And, uh, and I think there's a lot to mine. So um, let's, let's start with this. Uh, I, I want to talk about, you know, of course, COVID. I want to hear your thoughts, you independently of Illich. But you wrote this piece on your blog, uh, this um, uh, essay, where you uh, reply to, uh, to two um, colleagues in the Illich world, I, I, world, I imagine, uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuis and Wolfgang Palaver, um, who, um, who are now in the, uh, uh, you know, have a beef against what you were saying you, cause, because you were using Illich <clears throat> to, uh, to justify the COVID skeptic position, <laughs> to put it simply. And, uh, and therefore, and so now COVID is, uh, is a source of division. Uh, we've seen it everywhere. It, it's dividing countries. And I'm not sure that it's the virus itself that's doing that. I think we're doing it to ourselves. But it's dividing uh, friends of Ivan Illich. Um, t tell us, I mean, briefly, tell us a little bit what, um, what the, um, uh, the complaint was uh, against you and your interpretation of Ivan Illich. And what, well, what your response is? Two, two different people are involved. Jean-Pierre Dupuis was a, <clears throat> a friend and a close collaborator uh, with Ivan Illich uh, in the 70s uh, when he was, was uh, closely involved in the development of the text of Medical Nemesis, later Limits to Medicine. And I think they remained in touch subsequently and he uh, did a, a two-part article for a, an online journal in France, um, uh, definitely taking me to task and, and at least raising the question about how Illich is to be understood. I'll come back to what is at issue and what Illich says. The second was Wolfgang Palaver, who's a theologian uh, at the University of Innsbruck, both men are were very close to René Girard, mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, Wolfgang more so than to Illich, who he discovered a bit later and, and knew partly through me and through our friendship. But Wolfgang gave an interview to a, a German newspaper in which he also raised questions about what I was saying, about what Illich was saying, about particularly what Giorgio Agamben, an Italian philosopher who has been fairly outspoken was saying. So what's at issue is, is life, <laughs> no small word. Um, and, and Ivan's story on that front is that he was asked in the mid eighties uh, by an American uh, preacher, a Baptist preacher to discuss to come to a conference and discuss the question of life because, as this man said, life is tearing the church apart. Now, he was talking about abortion, nuclear disarmament, he, all of which he took to be somehow about life. Uh, and Illich came to this meeting, which has left no record. It was somewhere in Ohio. I can't discover any text or any 
no one has ever come forward to me and said I was there. But um, it, it, the atmosphere was somewhat tense. And it, before Il Ivan was to speak, a Catholic, a representative of the Catholic Bishops Conference who was there came to him and said that he should begin with a mollifying prayer to calm the atmosphere. And instead, Ivan got up. And he was a theatrical man. Uh, this was not uncharacteristic. And pronounced a solemn curse on life, which he repeated three times. Now, what was he doing? Well, th there is a text which was left by a meeting four years later in Chicago, where he addressed a Lutheran convocation. Right. To, and to he, be clear, I think I think it's important. I'd like to. Uh, you mentioned here. He said he said the curse was to hell with life. To hell right? with life. To hell with life. That's right. But. Uh, he obviously didn't mean that in a certain way, and he did mean it in another way. And what he actually meant was never well understood in his lifetime. I mean, I, I in Chicago, he called life an institutional fetish. In other words, he said life had become a resource uh, in the service of institutions that claim to know it, to protect it, to litigate on its behalf. Right. and so on to save so it. that yeah. so that life as uh, was being simultaneously sanctified and managed in the same gesture and he claimed that this was in fact a blasphemy that this was not the life more abundant available in jesus christ which was what he believed in and it, it said in the gospel i am life mm -hmm. simply the way, the truth, and the life is another formulation. So Ivan felt that this modern appropriation of life as a medical resource, as a legal resource, as an, a resource of the environmental movement, uh, to be put under management in the same gesture with which it's worshipped was what he wanted to denounce. But he, if I can just go on a little longer, I thought this was astonishing um and he he agreed to come on my with me on my radio series ideas in 1992 to to expound his position and i thought i had a hold of a bombshell i thought this was going to really be something and i have never ever broadcast a program I never in my whole time at the CBC ever broadcast a pro program to less response. It was like mm -hmm. I had farted. It just, it just, it was just embarrassed silence. It didn't make a ripple. And that was kind of what happened to him also, right? That he just, right. there was no resonance. Right. There was no response. It was, and his explanation of that was that this, in a way, is a new religiosity. Uh, it can't really be questioned. But it's all, in, in my view, it all came to a head during the pandemic uh, when saving lives was sure. the justification for everything. And to finally come to the end, that was where Dupuy and Palaver took issue with me and said that I was speaking irresponsibly, right? That indeed life did have to be conserved and saved, and that Illich can't have meant what I said he meant. Right. So, so it seems to me that there are two parts to this. One is um, uh, what you just mentioned here: the idea that life has to be saved uh, by the by the technocrats, right? And we should. Uh, um, you know, f follow their their directives and their orders, and submit submit to to, to their view. Um, and then the other one is, of course, is is to even to to trust that they know what they're doing, right? I mean, it, it's without any kind of um, uh, critical sense uh, to, to sort of immediately uh, assume that uh, that they know what they're doing, not not get a uh, any incl inkling. That, that they're improvising on the fly, um, so which, which I find sort of uh, 
very surprising from people who I would assume you know, are intellectuals, well-read, <laughs> have read uh, René Girard and, and, and so forth. And, and you, would, you would assume that there's some, some degree, some distancing that they can take between, um, uh, you know, perhaps the position that, yes, life has to be, to be preserved, but, but then to immediately conclude that these particular technocrats and these particular methods are the way to go. Um, uh, it, it's uh, interesting to me. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, why? Uh, I mean, were you surprised that, that well, you, you would be divided in, in the camp of um, of Illich uh, uh, intellectuals or? Uh, yes, I've been I've been uh, nothing but surprised for about two years. But uh, several things struck me, and we talked about this in, in an earlier conversation. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic and puzzled me and I didn't initially know very well how to understand them. But first, everyone seemed to understand from the outset exactly what needed to be done without, this was evidently a novel situation, a novel virus, but there was to be, it appeared from the outset, there was to be no discussion the course of action was clear, obvious, and mandatory. There was to be no scientific dissent brooked, even though numbers of epidemiologists, virologists, infectious disease experts spoke up and said, wait, 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 wait. I mean, to just take one example, John Ioannidis, who's at Stanford, um, not far from you, uh, said, you know, we could easily go over a cliff here if we begin to act precipitously without really knowing what's what. Uh, so that was striking. The other thing was that was striking was that what appeared to be a revolution in public health policy, i.e. the quarantining of the well during, during an epidemic, um, was also an obvious certainty rather than it was never presented as a revolutionary inversion of what had been conventional wisdom in public health up to that moment. And a lot of older public health professionals in Canada pointed this out, including former chief medical officers of health, deans of medicine, deputy ministers, a who's who of older public health professionals in Canada made a statement in the summer saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we need a balanced approach here, right? This, this will do harm as well. This, is, this putative good will also do harm. So let's have a look. And they, that was ignored too. So this, this absolutely surprised me. And it again surprised me when these criticisms came from two people, one of whom I regarded as a friend and another as a, a, an acquaintance, so I'm Pierre Dupuy, to whom I was well disposed. We, I wouldn't say we were friends. And they didn't take that into account. They never took account of my arguments um, about the harms that were being done, right? It seemed as if life was alone, right? as the soul god that we were to worship whatever saved or preserved life was good and whatever harmed or injured life was bad and there was to be no consideration about who gets to speak for life which life whose life right uh the questions about whether the old people who were imprisoned in, in care homes in Canada had ever got to say whether they wanted to be imprisoned in that way. Uh, their life was to be conserved regardless of what they thought about it, seemingly. So these things never came up. Right. And, and it was, that was, that was a, a sadness and a puzzlement to me. And, and that's partly why I wrote that long so, so it's puzzling that there's um, at once this um, 
uh, you talk about this religiosity, which I think is correct. I mean, a lot of people have noticed it. This, this, uh, um, you know, to to follow the science and and not question anything, and you know, extremely dogmatic. Um, and at the same time, there's sort of a there's also a utilitarian, very materialistic aspect to this, because it's about counting lives, right, and and cases and and counting lives and letting the technocrats manage the, the pandemics, which to me, in my mind, is a sort of a very uh, uh, utilitarian, materialistic uh, approach. You know, we're just going to count lives. You know, it's individual lives that, that you know, body, it's a body count type thing. Um, now, I mean, it's not entirely surprising that, that they would be connected, but they're, um, there's this, um, it's a strange combination because the utilitarians in general would, you'd expect that they would take into account, right, the pluses and the minuses. I mean, that's what the utilitarian calculus is generally about, you, you, you right, if, if you believe in it, you, you, uh, you put the pros and cons together in some kind of a big equation. Um, but here there's, there's accounting, but 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 the accounting <laughs> is hard to understand. Uh, it, it's it's logic. Uh, there's there's a utilitarian accounting with a religious um, fervor. I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but I I agree with you. I think it's a it's quite a puzzle. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't pretend to untangle it, and I think those who try to untangle it often arrive in difficult positions, right? Well, right. obviously the whole thing was planned. It must have been planned, right? It was a pandemic, mm -hmm. as, some, as some say, or, you know, because there are definitely mysteries in it. And one is the mystery of seeming to shoot, of people appearing to shoot themselves in the foot, right? Of making, of not doing exactly what they say they're doing. Right, which is right. risk analysis or cost benefit analysis, but it's a very incomplete analysis. And I, I don't know if I can untangle that, but I think what Ivan says, it's exactly what you just said, is that the sanctifying term, life, right, uh, in a way covers or pours unction, one might say, on the utilitarian term, right? So they, they're able to pass together right they're able to pass in and out of one another um and always with a kind of religious sanction uh and science so something called science is is sanctioned or sanctified in the same way as if it were a monolithic yeah more than that object, it's, it's, it's personal a, a kind of a, a kind of a god right and one could follow as and, one and his name is Fauci. God. Yes. <laughs> his well, name is Fauci. <laughs> I guess he declared that. Is that true that he actually said that? <laughs> I am science. Right. Essentially, he said, if you, if you criticize me, you criticize the science. <laughs> Les tats, c'est moi. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well. So, uh, so uh, your, your two friends um, had, uh, uh, you know, a beef with you and people like you and uh, Agamben for being irresponsible, right? I mean, you, you, your attitude was irresponsible. It was endangering others, right? And putting yes. other lives at risk right. and so forth. And I, I love a, a passage in your essay on, on this question of responsibility and irresponsibility. And, and you, you quote Illich again as, as saying that uh, responsibility, according to Illich, is something of a trap, a word that's easier to get into than get out of. And uh, yeah. so explain that a little bit. Well, he he claimed that universal responsibility, you know, saving the planet. Right. Let's take that as a slogan one here. Is, is, right. is, is, is maddening. It's literally maddening. I, I take complete leave of my senses and enter into a fantasy, right? Right. Responsibility is something I can exercise and within my within my grasp. Right. Within others. your power. Within your power. Within, my, within, within your my understanding. Within my power, I can be responsible. 
outside my power, I can't be responsible. Responsible. So he, I think he claimed, and I think others have said this too, that responsabilization then becomes a management strategy or a, a strategy of domination, right? Mm -hmm. By making people responsible for what they can't possibly be responsible for, right? Right. They, they are they are controlled. They are, they are held within. That's exactly uh, and, right. And I think I think that really puts the finger on what what happened the, the last years. I mean, with this pandemic, <laughs> that I mean, it's so it's so clear if you have any any, any sense of uh, of reality that uh, all the theater of masks and lockdowns and what has done nothing to, uh, to to alter the course of things except make people miserable. But because we're all made to feel guilty and, uh, you know, and uh, the sense of uh, 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 being responsible, right? We're all in this together. <laughs> you know, this, these slogans that are repeated um, make it such that people are, are, are paralyzed and, and extremely very easily manipulated through their sense, the, through this sense of, of guilt that they have a responsibility to act in a certain way, to play, their, to play right? We, we each play our part in this, uh, this global uh, uh, work of salvation against COVID. Yes, and, and very willingly, it seems. Right. I mean, a lot of people in, in my milieu uh, take that up gladly. Right. With enthusiasm. Right. And uh, again, and you, 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 you mentioned here that because it's, a, it, it's an abstraction, this, it means that responsibility is often exercised not in the face of an actual neighbor, but in relation to a risk profile. Yeah, right. Because you know we do this to improve the statistics, and, and that that we have no grasp of, so to speak. It's it's uh, it's really remarkable. But it's it, it's wonderful to. I mean, it's it shows the prophecy of um, the prophetic aspect of village. I mean, his his keen sense of how things are. I mean, that's what prophets are, right? Prophets are are people who know how things really are. <laughs> <laughs> have a sense of reality <laughs> yes and uh and 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 we see it here um let, let's uh let's move away from uh, uh Illich a little bit maybe there was one one oh one of the things maybe actually that that will help us maybe move the conversation away at some point you, uh, towards the end of your essay you quote uh the philosopher of science bruno latour and uh he says you say, I have for a long time agreed with the view of French philosopher of science Bruno Latour, who holds that we can, we can only get down to earth through a revival of politics, and that this revival will depend on a redefinition of the sciences that breaks the stranglehold of mythified science on politics. I, I think that's a crucial point. You, you want to you elaborate on this? Oh, well, uh, th this is too much almost to say briefly because right <clears throat> in a certain way this is Latour's whole body of work which is very very extensive going back to his first explorations of what the sciences actually do so mm -hmm. he was part of that movement that mm -hmm. tried to create a realistic sociology and anthropology of science as it's done rather than as it is idealized right uh, and but in brief, he, he said that in what he called the modern constitution, so go back to the 17th century, science becomes the voice of nature. And insofar as it's the voice of nature, it, it must abstain from politics. It's the very antithesis of politics, right? Mm -hmm. Politics is opinion its contest, its passion. Science speaks for nature. It, it saves us from politics. Um, now, I would say that Latour and his colleagues over, and this is many colleagues, I mean, there was, this is a very, this has been, a, in my opinion, a very big revolution in the history of, of philosophy and science that you could date from 
Ludwig Fleck, or later from Thomas Kuhn, and then on through many, many writers of whom I take Latour as a, as a type or paradigm uh, to show that the sciences are, are, of course, political. That doesn't mean that they don't strive for, for truthfulness at all. Mm-hmm. It just means that they're fallible human enterprises uh, taking a limited uh, rather than an omniscient view of things. And so it always was Latour's view that politics would only revive when the sciences entered, entered the political field as participants. Right. Not, well, not, not without evidence, not without a claim to make, right? Latour is, a con- is convinced let's, uh, by climate science, but he doesn't believe that climate science gives a definitive proof. He believes that through the accumulation of a, a thousand, a million <laughs> tiny details, a convincing picture has been put forward and can be argued and needs to be argued. So in the political arena, in right. the political right. arena, right. So that his, his view of the political arena then is of a place where absolutely different claims have to be, have to meet and be reconciled, right? It, 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 dema- it demands a new art yeah, of, of but- understanding and of peacemaking. So that's kind of his view in brief. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I haven't done it justice. I understand his view, but, uh, but I mean, there's still a problem because, I mean, the other aspect of, of, of this, I think, is, is the, the, the fact that uh, for the last at least, you know, 100, 200 years, and probably maybe, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not to the 17th century, but, but certainly soon after, there is an appeal to science to settle political Right. I mean, I mean, policy has to be. Yes. I mean, that's what we've seen. Yes. Right. We have to follow the science. Yeah. Right? We, we have to follow the science, and yet I think Latour is saying that the, the on the one, you know, first of all, the scientists themselves are subject to political passions, and 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 have their their biases. And number two, I'm not sure that um, uh, it, it makes any sense that pol- politics have to follow the science because the science doesn't tell us politics about is about ethics about how. We're going to live together, whereas the science, uh, in many ways, that doesn't, you know, I mean, cannot pronounce on any of that. It can, especially the modern science is, you know, is, is really essentially a, it's a, it's a technolo- technologically directed uh, right. field of knowledge, right? But to, to take Latour's example, if the climate is warming dangerously. That is a pretty major scientific datum, right? Uh, and it has to be argued and defended. It doesn't tell you in a straight line what policy should then be, but it's it's important. So help me help me understand how one creates a framework for rules in society that make, you know, make, make some sense. For instance, um, uh, there's been a spate of, uh, of violence that's erupted in Philadelphia over the course of the last 18 months for, for, for reasons that are, um, uh, let's say, uh, controversial. <laughs> but regardless, there's little doubt that there's been a significant amount of violence, that there's a massive uptick in violence, right? So if you if you are in certain parts of Philadelphia now, the risk of carjacking, the risk of all these things, the risk of walking to the corner store, I think that's one of the things you talk about in terms of there's risk to everything that you do, correct? Um, so part of what we do as a society, as a community is to try to, I guess, mitigate risks to some level so that you know your child can walk to a corner store without getting shot, correct? How? You know, and obviously it, all of us here, <laughs> it's preaching to the choir in terms of, you know, the inappropriateness of kind of what seemed to have happened with, with COVID, right? 
this idea that you could live in a zero risk world. But on the other hand, we do live in a society where we, it's not like we don't try to mitigate risk. No, it's not that many of us don't agree that we should have some police presence um, that allows, you know, a child to walk to a corner store at, you know, whatever, some right without getting shot, right? So how, how does one create this framework? It seems like what, what's happened to the Covidians, you know, the branch Covidian cult um, here that they, they have they have kind of gone off the rails but it's not that they, it's not that it doesn't come from somewhere it comes from somewhere it yeah. comes from a place that we all agree but how does how would how would illich i mean you being you know the expert on illich certainly and your thoughts on how, how exactly does one come up with this framework to kind of exist in society <laughs> well i'd say there's there's two points yeah in answer that i would make one is risk in, in one meaning is a mathematical construct, right? So risk is not the same thing as danger, right? Da danger is a vernacular idea, right? I might get shot if I walk to the corner store in Philadelphia. Risk is, is a mathematical construct and therefore belongs to a, a different sphere. So. I, I think we have to always know what we're talking about when we talk about risk. I think Illich's idea uh, was, he says this in Tools for Conviviality in which he, get, he sets out three conditions for recovery. He's talking about his idea of conviviality, recovering from industrial overreach. And one of them is to overcome the delusion about science. Well, what is the delusion about science? I think it's just what Michelle said a minute ago, that science, it's the delusion that science can answer moral questions. So we make policy in Canada now by following the science. But science doesn't, know or say how the, what what the best way to deal with an epidemic is uh, it doesn't tell you whether it's a good idea to ruin your public finances it doesn't tell you whether it doesn't tell you it can it can contribute to understanding who's going to be hurt by this policy if it's allowed to look across the board but I mean, what, what the science that's being followed uh, is, is barely. Right. No, you're right. It's, ba it's, ba it's barely science. You know, it no, is. You're, you're so yeah. right. It, it's, not, it's not science that tells us that uh, how to keep our community safe. I, I, at least I don't think so. It is sciences, and it's interestingly enough, science's attempt to tell us, you know, when science starts to try and quantify risks and tell you what is safe and what's not, what's the best way for a city to be, then that city is bound for destruction. <laughs> as, yes. as, you know, San, San Francisco appears to be. Um, so yeah, you're, you're very, but, but then how does one, what, what is the conceptualization of, so there's just some intuitive understanding of, not risk, I guess, because risk has some mathematical connotation, but there's some intuitive understanding of danger that we all have. And then how do we set up rules that based on this, feeling of danger to then create some construct that is, it is public health, right? I mean, it is public health to have the police uh, have some presence or, you know, whatever it is you want to have. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're playing this out right now in, in yeah. Ottawa and Canada, right? Yeah. Where the, right. The, the occupation of the city by the truckers who, right. according to the residents, lead on their horns at all hours, you know, it it's, it's, it's a very public, real. It's, a it's very real. It's ve yeah, it's very real. Um, so, but I don't have an answer really to your question. I, I think all Illich contributes is, which has been a lifelong interest for me, is if we could get clear on what science is, which I think would be first to pluralize the word. Right. There's no such thing as science. Right? right. You could probably go out in the street and find 
a majority who would speak to you about the science that science involves deploying the scientific method. But I don't think you'd find anyone who could tell you what the scientific method is. Right. Not in a satisfactory way. You could say, well, but does geology employ the scientific method? No. Well, is geology a science? Yes. Okay. Well, then, so there is no scientific method, right? There may be a scientific disposition. So pluralizing and, and complicating the picture is, is, I think, a crucial move. And I would say, this goes back to what we we're, were talking about with Michelle about life, right, and religiosity, is, is removing the aura, which is very much connected to the singular use of the term, right, that there's something called science that one follows, right? And one, one is, if one doesn't follow it, one is anti-science. Um, and so on. I mean, I've been told I'm anti-science uh, by people who know less about the actual sciences than I've forgotten in my life. So, uh, David, I, let me um, run this idea. I mean, I'll, I'll share my thoughts perhaps on, on this issue. Going back to this question of uh, utilitarianism that we discussed earlier. Yeah. So on this relationship between science and politics, one, one thing that, you know, so I'll give you a little bit of my, my, my political journey. I started off as a completely nondescript progressive for many, many years. And then I entered um, uh, both through, I mean, around the same time, but I, but I sort of, I, I changed and, and then discovered the uh, conservative libertarian movement in the US, maybe 10 years ago. Um, Ludwig von Mises and and that that circle of people and that started to make a lot of sense to me and so I, I switched to becoming a big government guy to a very little government guy but in, in order to uh, the problem was still how do you set the limits of government action and whatnot and 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 I, I, I couldn't find any answers to that in libertarian theory because uh, either you know in libertarian, if if you follow that group of people, then then they they either they shrug their shoulders and say we need a small government, we're not sure how to restrain it, or they say well we don't need a government at all, we can be you know an anar anarcho capitalist and and um, right. but but that didn't make sense to me, and so I so then I, I started reading and I came across sort of Aristotelian thought and and pursued that a little bit, and uh, and then. I think I have a good grasp of, of the, the traditional f philosophical realist view of the common good, which then disappears when you have in modern political societies. So the, the point that I want to make here is that uh, few people, I think, realize, or re I mean, people know it, but recognize that the father of, of modern science is Francis Bacon, right? And the father of our political order is Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes was the secretary to Francis Bacon, so they're both very closely connected, right? I mean, yeah, they, yeah. so so it, it, this 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 entanglement between science and politics, it, you know, for the last three hundred years, I think is is wrong, and I I, I want to, and 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 Hobbes's theory, uh, so changes the the idea of the common good as being a real a real. Um, uh, a real cause of us living together, a real political life, right? That it, he rejects that, and so we, political life, according to Hobbes, and since then is the social contract. We get together by will, by the will of the individual, right? So the individual free will. So we come together individually by our own free will. This is how we imagine our societies to to operate. And, and that becomes utilitarian, naturally, right? So the government yeah. is in place. The government is there to minimize the harm and, and maximize according to right, what, what the sum of uh, individual <laughs> wills and ends up dictating and so forth. And I think that's unworkable. And I think my, my view at this point is that we're reaching the end of this idea. And I don't know what 
uh, how it's going to turn out. But uh, but then of course that immediately that ends up calling into question our uh, very cherished uh, ideals, including the ideal of democracy, <laughs> right? Uh, the ideal of uh, you know I mean what's the, what's the role? I mean should there even be a public health um, system? Because the public health, in my mind, is a is a modern invention. It's an invention that uh, is necessarily a utilitarian invention. In fact, it's a, it's a contradiction in turn because health, by its own nature, is an individual good. It's not part of the common good. It distinguishes the individual good from the common good, and therefore, public health makes no sense, right? I mean, it it it, it, it commonizes something that is completely individual. So. So, so I, I've become really, uh, you know, and I think I have an ally in Illich. I think he would, uh, he, he would be symp sympathetic to my radical. I don't know if he, he would agree with them, but I think he'd be, he might be sympathetic to my really very radical political notions now that um, uh, are, are difficult to talk about. But what are your thoughts? I mean, right now, let me ask you this point blank. You're in Canada. You're a Canadian citizen. What do you think of? Uh, of the Canadian healthcare system, is this a good or a bad, <laughs> right? So, are we at the point where we have to re-question everything? And I think we are. And so, what what are your thoughts on these things? Well, I, about the uh, the Canadian healthcare system, it's a good and a bad in one. So, that's, that's a cop out. Too <laughs> that's, well, let me try a, a longer answer and okay. then maybe yes, get yes. back to that. Right. So. Right. Okay. You mentioned von Mises mm -hmm. and the libertarian tradition. And Ivan was a great a lover of the work of Karl Polanyi, uh, a, a Viennese, mm -hmm. uh, well, originally, originally from Budapest, but uh, who was a great antagonist of von Mises and his school. Mm -hmm. And so I had naturally a, thrown in my lot with Polanyi and, and got quite a surprise uh, during the pandemic to find that many of the people I was in conversation with who were making sense to me in analyzing the pandemic were indeed called libertarians, right? Right. So, the Great Barrington Declaration. Yeah, is, uh, for example, right, the Great right, Barrington right, Declaration right. given at the American Institute for Economic Research, which is one of the think tanks of, of what's called libertarianism. I know the term isn't precise. Right. Uh, and that put a question back on the agenda about Illich. Well, is Illich in fact a libertarian? Well, he's not, not a libertarian in, in the sense that he's, he's calling for everything to get smaller, everything to be brought under restraint, right? For the, uh, he's calling for the disestablishment of the school system. Let's mm -hmm. say in deschooling mm -hmm. society, he's called for he's calling for a much chastened medical system. Right? He's saying that certain advances in public health are are definitely goods, right? That a, there's a certainly a basic pharmacopoeia which is a blessing. To mankind, he's saying that certain kinds of medical interventions are helpful, and that the whole thing has gone way beyond uh, where it should have gone, and is making us all crazy, and is making us all worship health, and is indeed, in his second phase of thinking about medicine, has proceeded to the point where it's actually. Uh, fundamentally changing our self image, right? That we are, are becoming, he says, disembodied. I mean, in the sense that, to the extent that we're, mm -hmm. we're creatures of scans and various medical constructs that, 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 that take us out of some kind of deep sitting in our, in ourselves. So, my answer to this, and maybe this is a cop out too, is that we we can barely think about these things um, without fundamentally reconceptualizing the territory, right? So Illich 
one one conclusion you can draw out of my book and out of the earlier book, The Rivers North of the Future, when he portrays modernity as an extension of church history and the West entirely as a kind of perverse incarnation or corrupted incarnation of the gospel, it's clearly an invitation to go back and rethink the whole enterprise. No. Who knows how that can be done? Uh, it, it can be adopted as a disposition to ask certain <laughs> questions. So he wants to he wants to go back, and uh, and I think rethink. So I think it's very hard to to sort out the question, let's say, of the Canadian medical system. <coughs> With, without without that rethinking mm -hmm. right uh, right so so my my point i mean i'll give you again I mean, maybe i, I shouldn't i'm in the habit of speaking more than my guests but um my um so if we recapture the 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 real under the the correct understanding of the common good as a really as a metaphysical principle right so i use the the boogaboo word metaphysical principle of living together and, and that the political authorities, really their scope of action is on the safeguarding of the common good, then, then you don't have the public authorities, you don't have the, um, this, this uh, infusion of money and power into things that are, have nothing to do with the common good, for example, education and medicine and you don't get medicine on steroids, which is what Illich describes in Medical Nemesis, right? So something gone awry. And, and that mm -hmm. now is completely, it's, it's this Frankenstein that has, that has emerged. Um, if you look at it historically, it's not, and I think we discussed it uh, on, our, on our previous uh, podcast, it didn't emerge uh, organically. It emerged with a very big infusion of public, uh, of political capital, right, over the last hundred years. Uh, the medical system, the medical system mm -hmm. was sort of encouraged. And so that, so same thing with education, same thing with science in many ways, right? So uh, we had also a podcast with, I don't know if you know, Terence Keeley, who's a British scientist who laments the, he talks about the, the myth of the public, public funding of science. And uh, so, so all these things that are good in themselves, but have become uh, monstrosities because they've been associated with the common good when in fact they are goods that should be developed organically um, and, 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 and if, they, if they are developed organically then they maintain their proper proportion as opposed to this disproportionate uh, attention that they, yeah. they get from, 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 um, from the political, from, from society quote unquote, meaning, you know, this, um, so, so, so that's, that's one way, but that's, that's, um, uh, that's, you know, I mean, how do we, uh, you know, do we get there from where we are now? Uh, that's of well, course a different, different question. And, uh, and how do we even get it in a democratic society? Do we, can we even think about getting that in a democratic society? Well, I, I don't, I, I don't think Illich is a man with answers, but he, and he never wanted to be no, that. I have all but, the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I would say is that th throughout his work, I mean, if you go back to the what he saw in Puerto Rico vis-a-vis -vis schooling, he felt that young Puerto Ricans were being disabled right. by this enterprise. Right. If you look at development, he felt that people in, in the rush to modernize, to develop crucial abilities and adaptations, cultural goods were being lost and, and, and potentially trampled. Now for that, he was often accused of being a romantic and, right. you know, and, and, and you know, the, having the aristocrats, one, one journalist said the aristocrats sentimental attraction for cultures of 
poverty untainted by bourgeois aspiration. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that was it. I think he was saying something's going to be lost here. And you find this throughout, right? Later in Shadow Work, the book you were reading, he tries to bring the term vernacular into play. Right. Right? What is it that's within our hands, within our voices, within our abilities to make a place on which we can stand vis-a-vis -vis these great institutions, these great ideas? Right? Without a place to stand, without a sense of what I'm talking about or what I mean when I say something, because all the words are borrowed, all the words are colonized before they, before I reproduce them, mm -hmm. then there's, there's, there is no answer until that ground is, is recreated. So right. that in, in his understanding, I think that's the priority, right? And yeah. you can't, you, in the, in the COVID discourse, the, we are moving into an idea of not only national societies, but even the globe itself as an immune system, right? right. That we are all just pieces of an immune system. Well, that completely removes any ground from under one's feet, right? any ground for for personal right intuition or anything that I, i'm purely my function within a within a global system um and i i think a, a lot of the people that i i know and love <laughs> think that way you know that they actually uh because i'm unvaccinated um they see me as well, irresponsible right an irresponsible right. person somebody and they don't really care to discuss it right uh be, because why why would you talk to such a person um so this is a, a big yeah. preoccupation of mine yeah. now that, that there's no dialogue that there's no it's a great paradox because because in these political institutions that were ostensibly developed for the defense of individual rights and individual liberty, right, the last 300 years, the Enlightenment project and so forth, uh, end up completely, <laughs> completely uh, uh, abrogating uh, the, 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 the notion of individuality and, and doesn't allow someone like you to flourish and, you know, and, and uh, decide to to be happy the way nature made you uh, as an individual without the vaccine and without the vaccination. Um, it, it's, but, but I mean, is the dialogue possible? I mean, is it, do you want to, uh, you, you mentioned Illich, I think you're right. I mean, calling uh, uh, attention to this uh, ground that is, shifting underneath our feet or disappearing or or completely or you know in the face of this institution but i don't know that i mean these institutions have have they're there they have their own logic and their own logic is moving them in this direction of of crushing us <laughs> and i don't know right. that we can we can well, we can enter into a dialogue with them i think we um we, we have to completely uh, uh but uh, let me let me take the canadian case right right now because I, I had a very uh, a pleasant experience on Saturday, which was to go out to the demonstration in Toronto that was in support of the tr truckers who are occupying mm -hmm. part of our mm -hmm. national mm -hmm. capital. Mm -hmm. And to find myself uh, amongst people I liked and, and seemed very much... Uh, the kind of fellow citizens that I imagine that I have. Uh, I was blessed probably more frequently than I've ever been blessed in my life. The atmosphere was, was extremely peaceful, uh, enthusiastic. Uh, the crowd was quite mixed. 
I met a number of people who were immigrants. Uh, I met a number of people of color. Now, okay, so enough of that. Now, go to the people who organized the counter demonstration that day, many of whom are my neighbors uh, and friends. They would tell you, and our prime minister has said this, that the people who are on the hill in the trucks and their supporters are bigots, they're misogynists, mm -hmm. they're white supremacists, they're racists, right? They're reckless, careless, thoughtless people. Who knew Canada so had this, so many of those people? <laughs> so this, this began with the election of Donald Trump and with Brexit. Now, I don't think it began with it, but that I became mm -hmm. aware of it then, that, that instead of people saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? What on earth would animate that many Americans to elect this joker? Or what would make that many English people or British people uh, vote for this folly as the others considered mm -hmm. it to be? And I thought the same thing when these all these truck when this massive truck convoy came to Ottawa, I thought, well, surely people are going to say, wow. It's really cold. It's really cold in Canada. What what motivated these people to do this extraordinary thing? To to manifest like this? But no. The enemy psychology is so powerful. It's so strong, right? That right. that the the conversion that I always hope for never seems to occur. Right. You know, but, because, I continue, but I continue to hope for it. Yeah, because the, the current system, the current political reality of the last 200 years corrupts us. It's corrupting. It's corrupting to have, uh, you know, the government pay for health care and pay for education and whatnot, because then then immediately any kind of any political change is going to threaten some people right because you know we all benefit yeah. at some yeah. level right? there's a material yeah. benefit that we all gain individually and and so any any change is going to be a threat to, to a well you portion. could certainly look at it that way that all the people who are against these manifestations are in in some way incorporated in the state as as you right. just said, right. Right. and the ones who are protesting are the ones who feel themselves not to be so incorporated yeah. on this right? particular on this particular question. And then you may have a, a different problem and it may be right. It, it may segregate in a different way. But yeah, um, yeah. But, but I think you're but right. on I the mean, other hand, on the other hand, a, a reckoning is coming. Uh, uh, with our finances, mm -hmm. um, with uh, the that somebody somehow people are going to have to get back off this shelf uh, unless they really are able to implement a policy of co getting constant boosters against COVID nineteen. Uh, I mean, people will bail after five or six or four or whatever uh, it it can't be sustained so a lot of things are going to happen in the next year or two I, they may I, well be bad right but there's an opening there's an opening to talk about the situation at least i'm afraid that it's not going to be radical enough in my lifetime i'm i'm afraid mm -hmm. that um you know the the mandates will be rolled back maybe not completely but 90 percent to the point that you know, public opinion is calmed down. There'll be some return to the, the old way, but not completely. The same people in the political classes will remain in place and, you know, the, the, and the game will continue to, to play itself. I, I, I hope you're right. I mean, I hope you're right. I mean, I think it, <laughs> we, we are living through momentous times. So there's no question about it. Um, and I have no idea how it's gonna, gonna end up. But more and more people are left out Right. And more and more people, and th those are the same people by and large who are hurt by the pandemic most. 
And, well, actually, and let me right. So me... if 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 you cannot, so there there's a ground there to think about a different kind of society. You're absolutely right, and there's actually one one aspect of the Canadian rebellion, the the truckers' rebellion, that to me is actually striking. Um, for the last two years, a lot of people, you know, the, the people on our side have spoken out against the damages of the lockdowns. But a lot of people who, who you know, us, uh, Ioannidis, uh, Jay Bhattacharya, who was on the show, you know, a couple of months ago and so forth. Oh, was he good? But, yeah, but a, a lot of He's us... He's a bit of a hero of mine. But a lot of us have not been personally affected by the lockdowns, right? So a lot of the, the talk from the people who say, listen, we're really causing a lot of damage uh, uh, on the one hand, it's correct. On the other hand, it was hard to reconcile with the fact, with, with the relative peace and the relative, uh, you know, go along that's been going on. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so it was it wasn't the people in the street. You know, we, we were we were speaking in the name of, you know, the blue collar people, the the uh, the people in the third world countries that are that are suffering. But, but we were not seeing any any physical. Uh, uh, manifestation of that, the damage being done, and 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 may, this in Canada maybe the first, uh, the first movement that we see for of people actually affected by, by these policies. Well, it seems to be uh, certainly a lot of people have come out uh, and and manifested themselves. What where that will go politically. I think that's 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 an open right david it's been wonderful to speak with you again what, what are we... oh my god we're already uh anish you want to you know i've i've talked you know I've, I've monopolized the conversation here no no it's a wonderful conversation it's a wonderful framework to think about uh think about these things and uh so it's always always fantastic talking to well, you uh, oh. what are your uh, uh, but people should follow you. I, I, I hadn't, but I, I just subscribed to your, your, your blog news, you know, your, your blog on at the David Kaylee.com. So D D A V I D C A Y L E Y.com to read a lot of wisdom. I want to call attention to the archives of your radio show and podcast that are on your, on your, on your website. It's a gold mine of, of extremely enriching, uh, interviews and conversations. Thank you. And what, what, do you have any plans? Are you working on anything you want to share with us? Well, the aside from speaking up for that Illich book whenever I'm asked about it, uh -huh. which is happily pretty often, um, I'm working on a book about the CBC. Okay. So I, I worked all my life at the Canadian Broadcasting, most of my adult life at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is... I would say now fully within the what we've been talking about the, the mm -hmm. COVID consensus. Right. right. No no dissent allowed. Right. The demonization of dissent and opposition and so on. And I I I feel I was given an astonishing opportunity during 30 years at that program that I worked for ideas to explore freely and the record is is there on the website and i feel like now the, the right. horizons have closed in the boundaries have narrowed and i would like to make an argument for the cbc or for any public broadcasting as an open space as a, a if you want a negative space or a hypothetical space, a place where um, ideas can can meet, where where people can compare notes, and where and 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 to try and ask what then it would be the axioms on which you could construct such a space, and and certainly peace would be. It's going to be one of them, right? Uh, of, of avoidance of, of war, inclusion, acceptability of all points of view, and so on, and recognition that we're really in a philosophical and religious wilderness 
in which a lot of work has to be done to make sense of things. And there ought to be a place where people are trying to make sense of things. So I'm working on that book uh, in a kind of wild, not quite sure what it is yet way. We look forward to it. David, thank you very much. <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> it's a pleasure. Anish, nice to see you again. Howdy. So all the best.